Hi everybody! Guess what? It's Gretchen Horlacher again, Professor Horlacher, and this is a little review of all the materials we've had in Chapter 3 uh, using this Bach Chorale you see here, Bach 106, as a sample. And so I'm going to play this through on the piano, and as I do so, why don't you pick a voice part and sing along with it? And here is the key. So here is the opening chord. And I'm just going to play the first uh, four bars. Here we go. Two, three, four. And I'll play it one more time, and you can try singing a different voice part. Three, four. Okay. We'll come back to this in a minute once we've done some review of the materials that we now have in order to make something like this uh, very rich and meaningful to us. So I'll advance to the next slide. And here you see the kinds of things we've been doing this week. We have a toolkit of symbols and each of them let us hear pitches in a very rich context. So these are the things that we've been talking about recently. And each of them has a degree of stability or instability. And also, there's a degree of dissonance or consonance. And each of them supplies this kind of thing. There, that's consonant. A-N-C-E, there. Each of them supplies these things in different sorts of ways, and so a single pitch can have so many different kinds of identities. One of them is scale degree. And so we know that scale degree one sounds very, very consonant and stable. We know that seven, the leading tone, sounds very unstable, and it is a tendency tone, just is, as is lowered six which likes to go down. We also know that intervals have a degree of consonance or, or, or dissonance. And so the perfect fifth is a very consonant interval. We just change it a little bit. The diminished fifth is a very dissonant interval. When we have three pitches going at one time, we call it a triad. And the major and the minor triads are much more consonant and stable then is the diminished triad. And the augmented triad doesn't much come up, so I'll put a parenthesis around this. We're going to talk about five kinds of seventh chords in this class. Seventh chords are always dissonant because they always have a seventh in them. So we have the major major, the major minor, which gets used a lot because it's the one that occurs on the dominant, often called the dominant seventh. We have the minor minor, the half diminished, there's my little slash through the circle, seventh, and the fully diminished, seven, without the slash through the circle. All seventh chords are dissonant, but they have different flavors of dissonance, and a lot of them has to do with things we already know, the kinds of intervals that are in them, what scale degrees they occur on what kinds of triads they have in their lower triadic base. Roman numerals tell us where these kinds of sonorities occur in a key. So there's a major triad on one that sounds extremely stable. There's also a major triad on four that doesn't sound quite as stable because it has scale degrees in it other than one, three, and five. We also care a whole lot about what is sounding in the lowest voice, the bass. So in triads, when the root is in the bass, it's 5-3, but we don't need that. It, the abbreviation is just simply a blank. 6-3 is when the third is in the bass, 
and the 3 is, is an optional, 6 is the abbreviation, and 6, 4 is when the 5th is in the base. In 7th chords, we can have a root, 3rd, 5th, or 7th in the base, and so the symbols are 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, and 4, 2. And one other symbol that's worth knowing is this. If you see a sharp standing by itself, it means the third above the base. The sounding base, not the root. Whatever is sounding in the base. All right, so there's our, our series of, of symbols that help us characterize sounds very, very precisely. Going on to the next slide. We have a few things we keep track of as we write these sonorities. One is how they're spaced, and here we have an option of putting them in closed position. This is putting them as tight as possible. Another is, is a variety of open positions, so that there might be some space between the alto and the tenor, or the tenor and the bass. And the third thing we want to remember is that between the soprano and the alto, and the alto and the tenor, no more than an octave. That'll help us make nice, great sounding chords, just like we heard in saying in the Bach just a few minutes ago. When we're talking about triads and we write for four parts, S-A-T-B, we have to double something since there's only three pitches in a triad. The thing to remember mostly is never double. Can you guess what you should not double? Anything that's dissonant, basically. Never double a leading tone. Never double a tendency tone. And never double a seventh of a chord. Most of the time, we double roots. But as we go through the semester and learn how to use various chords, we'll see lots of occasions where that might not also be possible. Okay, no, let's go on and look at the Bach one more time. This is a piece in A major. And so I'm going to write the Roman numeral figured bass analysis under here in a minute. But first, I'm going to talk about some of these other identities that add meaning to this. This chorale starts out by going 3, 2, 1, and then right back up 2, 3, 4, 5. We've seen a lot of stepwise melodies like this. And we've also seen a lot of melodies also that use 6 as kind of a decoration of 5. And as you might expect, it goes back down 4, 3, 2, 1. Nice, easy thing to sing. This is a chorale, after all, that would have been sung in church, and so people need easy melodies. That looks like a great soprano. Look at the difference in the bass line. The bass line is characterized more by leaps, and as I said the other day, if you're going to leap, chances are you're going to leap through a chord. So here we have one, five, three, five, one. Those are easy scale degrees to find when we're leaping. Very similarly, over here, we have five, seven, excuse me, two, seven, five, the members of the five chord. And we close with a cadence going five, one. Okay. Now the one chords are spaced in a lot of different ways. This is an open spacing of the one, but it's pretty close. It sounds like this. That sounds very different than the spacing we get in this one chord, where the bass is way down here, and the other three are tucked very closely right here. That gives us something interesting to listen to. You might say the same thing right here about these two five chords. Here's one version of a five chord where the top three voices are very close. And the one that comes at the first fermata is more broadly spaced, like that. Those are all things that help us understand how this piece sounds the way it does. Another thing I'm going to say before I add the analysis that this, there's just two places in this particular uh, series of chords where there are seventh chords. 
one of them is right here, and one of them is right here. And so to hear those seventh chords come in, in places that are primarily triadic, adds a certain zest to the sound. And so I need that seventh, which is scale degree four, to resolve down. And the other one, this happens to be a 2-6-5 chord, as I'll write in in a minute. Look how those pitches are so close together, and especially the way the seventh chord is spaced. And it's no surprise that that comes right at the end, the moment of tension that resolves. Okay, the last step is to add the Roman numerals. So we have 1, 5, 3, 5. And then a 1, 6, because the third scale degree 3 is in the bass. 5. I'm going to write down here because I'm running out of space. 5. Excuse me, 1, 2. You can listen to the difference in quality between the 1 and 2 there, major and minor triads. And here's bar 3, 2, a 5, 6, followed by a 5, 7, and a back to 1, and then the last bar, bar four. There's where we get that very special two, six, five, five. It has a seventh added to it just at the last minute, and then a one. I hope you go back and listen to this uh, in light of the things that we've just heard, and you can do that by going back to slide number one. See you in class.